For those of you that did not ride on the elevator down with me, my name is Eno. I'm going to be your tour guide for this stop and the next two stops. So most of you got kind of acclimated to the room and checking out the views, taking your pictures. I'm going to tell you exactly what you're looking at in about a minute or so. But right now, we're going to concentrate or focus on this very, very big uh, aerial view of Hoover Dam and the surrounding area. And this is what I'm basically going to talk to. And what I'm going to do is give you a brief presentation on how we built Hoover Dam to kind of complement the movie you saw upstairs, and also you can catch up with the parts you missed if you were sleeping through the movie, all right? But first things first, where are we on this big old diagram? Well, you know we're inside a divergent tunnel right now. There were four of them built back in the 1930s. Two of them were built directly into the Arizona Canyon walls, and two were built directly into the Nevada Canyon wall side, right? Well, we're going to eliminate these two in Arizona because we're not there. We're going to focus on these two in Nevada. These divergent tunnels in Nevada took life oh, about a half a mile upriver. And they're about a mile long, each one of them. But if we take a look at this one in particular and follow it just parallel with the dam, folks, that's where you are. You're standing inside a room, inside this divergent tunnel, 537 feet from where you first started upstairs at the theater level. You're basically 54 hotel floors straight down to the Black Canyon rocks, all right? So that's where we are. Now that we know where we are, here's, here's the story of Hoover Dam. Once the site was selected, and this was that site they selected in 1930, what they did is they moved upriver about a half a mile, and they did build those four diversion tunnels. Two of them, like I said, went right into the Arizona Canyon Wall side. Two of them went right into the Nevada Canyon Wall side. Well, now these diversion tunnels took two years to blast through them all, they're all 50 feet in diameter, each one of them, and they're all about 4,000 feet in length, each one of them. And what was the purpose of the diversion tunnel? To divert or reroute the mighty Colorado River around <coughs> the selected work site in preparation for building of that dam. Next, they built two copper dams, or what we call temporary dams. A 100 feet tall upper copper dam, a 60 feet tall lower copper dam. That upper copper dam prevented the Colorado River from flowing directly into the worksite. That lower copper dam prevented the same Colorado River from backflowing into the worksite. Now that the worksite was nice and dry, they went back to it and they excavated 135 feet down to the bedrock of the river and removed all loose rock and debris. Next, a 16-ton bucket of concrete 
was delivered and poured every 78 seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop for two straight years, day and night, till they build over dam. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that equals to 6.6 .6 million tons of concrete, or enough concrete today to build a standard two-lane highway from San Francisco to New York City. That's how much concrete is in Hoover Dam. Once Hoover Dam was completed, they went back upriver, and they closed the three of the four diversion tunnels. And when I say close them, we know that they're about 4,000 feet in length. So what they did is they plugged the first half of each one of them, or the first 2,000 feet, with concrete. So they plugged them, closed them with concrete. They did that for the two diversion tunnels in Arizona and the one in Nevada. However, temporarily, they kept that last one open to keep the Colorado River flowing downstream while they need start to fill up. And that took about six and a half years for the lake to fill to its full capacity. However, on the final year of this project, they did build four intake towers. Two of them were on the Nevada side, two on the Arizona side of the lake. Now these intake towers are 395 feet tall. If you're standing on top of Hoover Dam today, staring at the lake, there are the big concrete structures that rise out of the lake. And what do these intake towers do? They move water from the lake down to these 30 feet diameter penstock pipes, all the way down to the generators to produce power. Now these 30 feet diameter penstock pipes can move water at the rate of 96,000 gallons per second. That would be enough water to fill an Olympic sized swimming pool in less than seven seconds. And most of you, when you came into the room, and if you took a look to your left, you've already met one of these big 30 feet diameter penstock pipes that moves water from the intake towers on the lake down to the generators to produce power. In fact, this penstock pipe runs directly underneath this room that we're in. And it's housed inside this big 50 feet diameter diversion tunnel, which we're all standing inside of this morning. On any given day, if there was water rushing from the lake down to this big old penstock pipe going towards the generators, this room could be shaking like an earthquake. But as long as I continue to stand very still, talk to you calmly like I'm doing now, and smiling at you, we're okay. But if I were to drop my microphone for whatever reason and start running for that door, please follow me. <laughs> and I'll answer all your questions way down there by the, gym, the elevator, right? Okay, but right now it's relatively quiet, but when water does flow through, again, they will branch off through, uh, down the, eventually down the way through smaller penstock pipes, about 13 feet in diameter and those will feed the individual generators and make power. The rest of the water just flows out the Colorado River or the tail race. Now to help that water flow more freely, they dynamited that lower copper dam. It's no longer there. However, that 100 foot tall upper copper dam, they just left that intact after all these years. It's just now submerged under a couple of hundred feet of water inside the lake today. In fact, it's helping collect the silt for the dam, right? Now the very last thing I want to bring your attention to are this big spillway. We have one in Arizona, one in Nevada. These spillways are on the outer edges of the dam, on the lake mean side. <coughs> They're positioned 27 feet below the top of Hoover Dam. Their job with these spillways is to never ever let water come over the top of Hoover Dam. You don't want that to happen. You've got 17 commercial generators, a power plant, many employees, and right now 75 guests with Eno. <laughs> now these spillways have only been used twice in recent history. The first time in 1941 when they tested them. The second time in 1983, just a little over 30 years ago, when they did prevent flooding from the heavy snow melts on the Rocky Mountains due to a fantastic El Nino year the winter before that. If you look at this picture to your right, that's an actual photograph of the summer fall of that 1983 year. Water was overflowing into the spillway systems on both sides of the lake for 63 consecutive days. That was a lot of water. And if you're curious, this is the Nevada side of the spillway, because that's the lake. There's the two intake towers on the Nevada side, two intake towers on the Arizona side. Look how close the water comes to the top of the dam, about 22, 23 feet. Exactly how the spillways were designed to work, all right? So before I end my presentation, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just gonna close by telling you that earlier I did inform you that we closed or plugged the three of the four diversion tunnels because we left that last one moving to Colorado River. They actually plugged that last one sooner than the dam was built. So now they're all truly plugged at least halfway, these diversion tunnels, with concrete. However, the latter half of these diversion tunnels, which were not plugged with concrete, are still in use today by the Hoover Dam in such a fashion. The two outer diversion tunnels have been connected with these big old spillway systems that continue to provide any outflow of any future flow of water. And the two inner diversion tunnels have been linked with these big old penstock pipes, such as you see the one run under, running underneath this room, 
that continue to this day providing water 